You're on. <laughs> if able, please stand. Welcome. It's good to have each of y'all here for our Celebration of Freedom event. Uh, I would say this was our 20th one, but we missed last year. So we're just at 19 uh, because of last year's COVID dynamics. Uh, but it's good to have you back. And I know we're not necessarily post-pandemic, but at least we're to the point that we're back out among people. And so we're glad to have you here today on this Celebration of Freedom Sunday. If you've been with us previously, you know we tend to have themes in relation to various uh, celebrations that we do, have had various themes over the years. And this year, uh, because of the dynamics that we've lived in as a society and as we've been recovering as a society post the pandemic, a variety of other dynamics going on in our society, uh, this year I uh, wanted to do a kind of special emphasis because our country and our community both face another challenge that can only be addressed. We as Americans do it best when we do it together and when we, when we work together as a community to help solve problems. And so one of the things we're gonna be referencing today uh, is a new program that we're bringing to the Lake Erie called PROUD, and we'll get a, you'll get a sense as to what that is later. But basically it's the opioid crisis that we're having in this country, the recovery dynamics that can occur when folks are addicted to those dynamics. So that's part of the emphasis uh, that we're doing today because we want to rally as a community, we want to rally as a country uh, to help folks get into recovery, to be part of recovery, and we want to talk about it today to make sure that we are doing that. So, I kind of feel hip at this point because I know the hip pastors get to ask people to pull out their cell phones. So I want you to pull out your cell phone for a moment, if you would. And if you don't know how to do this, ask your grandchildren to help you if you don't know how to <laughs> handle the smartphone. What I want you to do is, is I want you to type in on your website, www.surveymonkey.com, if you've ever done a SurveyMonkey, surveymonkey.com forward slash R forward slash pre, P-R-E-L-A-K-E-O-C-O. -E so pre Lake Oco, okay? So for pre Lake Oconee, it's the event that we're doing today. Uh, we're trying to do some surveys to see how effective these kind of programs are, and so help us with that. We're going to do a pre-test and a post-test. So it's www.surveymonkey.com front slash r front slash pre Lake Oco, all one word, P R E L O, excuse me, P R E L A K E O C O. Has anybody found it yet? We're going to see who won it wins. <laughs> Yay, so it does work, okay. So folks have done a quick survey, if you don't mind, and handle the survey if you would do it. Again, monkey 
Survey.com front slash R front slash pre Lake Oka. No, excuse me. Yeah, pre Lake Oka. So if you will do that and fill out the survey, we have a special treat that we're going to kind of kick off this morning with. David is going to play uh, some special music as you finish doing the survey. So if you will do that, uh, and then we'll kick into the rest of our patriotic music. David, if you will give us your special music. SurveyMonkey.com, front slash R, front slash Lake, pre-Lake Oka. For those of you who hesitated uh, to do the survey, uh, if you do the pre-survey and post-survey, you get into a raffle for $50 gift certificates. So uh, there are prizes. <laughs> so for those of you who hesitated, you know, go back and do it. Thank you, uh, We're gonna begin the first, uh, let's stand for this if we can, first round of patriotic medley. Hello, my name's Bruce Anger, and Yesterday when I was told I was going to be song leader, I got worried because I figured I'd only sung about 15 minutes in the last 15 months. But after listening to you people do the national anthem, I see we don't have to worry about the ability to carry a tune and sing a song. So let's get started with uh, My Country Tis a Day.
As we begin uh, the PROUD program here in the Lake Oconee area, we're partnering with the Advantage of Mental Services out of Athens, which uh, some of you may have had interactions with in years past, and we're just glad that they're looking to expand into Green County, and we're glad that we can be of assistance to them with that. Our first speaker today is Catherine Mills, who works at Advantage. She's been there since 2009, and she's worked in the areas of substance abuse and mental health programs. It was, in, it was in 2017 that she created this PROUD program, Peers in Recovery from Opioid Use and Dependence. She identifies herself as a person in long-term recovery. Let's give a big hand for Catherine and welcome her here. So I'm going to do this and hope that you can hear me pretty well. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm so honored to be here with all of you. And thank you for the guidance because I went to the wrong marina. So I really do appreciate <laughs> the guide. Um, yes, uh, my name is Catherine Mills and I, um, I manage an opioid treatment program uh, in Athens, Georgia through Advantage Behavioral Health Systems. But first and foremost, I am a person who identifies as being in long-term recovery. So what that means for me is it has been 13 years, three months, and two days since I, oh! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but, but, but that is not for me. That is, that, that, the ability to find that recovery, to not have to self-medicate, not quite on a daily basis, but it was pretty frequent. That is only because I found the accountability and the hope. And I'm, a, I'm living, living proof that recovery is possible. Um, I, I see on a daily basis triumphs from addiction. I see people learning to walk a pathway of recovery and sustain that journey. And I can tell you all too often I have also seen the tragedies because addiction is really, really, really powerful. Um, I don't have to live in that life of addiction anymore. And I, I love the fact that God has given me the ability to, to be of service to other people, um, to help them maybe land in a space and time and place where, where these individuals who are so desperate for connection and so broken and who many, many of whom have caused collateral damage um, with employers, with, with family members, uh, with their own physical health. Um, I'm in a, a position where, where maybe if they can come in and have a conversation with me, we can find a, yeah, get a little emotional here, we can find a little common ground. Because when they get to us, usually they are completely hopeless. And that's where I was. I had tried for years not to drink. And I couldn't do it by myself. That's the, that's the, the bottom line. And the, the hope is I didn't have to. Once I got past my own barriers and my own fear and my own self-judgment, I was able to get the help I needed. Um, so let's shift gears, get out of the emotional space, cat. Come on, come on, come on. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about all the lovely smiles that I see back at the clinic. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the addictive brain because a lot of times people do not quite understand why this individual and their family does not stop doing what they say they're going to stop doing, why they continue to do the behaviors over and over, but they say they're going to be different and it's going to be different. And that is all about the addictive brain. What happens to the, and, and I'm not a, uh, let me say, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a pharmacist, um, but, but my program has found a way to speak to an individual just like they're coming in. So I'm gonna basically paraphrase what I would say to somebody coming in um, to see us. Um, in your brain is, deep inside your brain is, is a system called the limbic system. And within that limbic system, is, um, is an area that basically is in charge of the reward system, okay? So the reward system is a great thing. It teaches us from a very, very early age how to get what we need in order to survive. So if you're hungry, a baby cries, a baby's fed, 
suddenly there's that feel-good stuff is going on, right? And, there, and there's that sense of well-being. Because we want to feel good. So, so when that works in a beautifully natural way, whether we're hungry or whether we're thirsty or whether we're needing social connection, a hug, a smile, a handshake, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But when you introduce drugs or substances into that system, the brain, which is an amazing computer, does not know how to differentiate. And it gets hijacked because the brain's reward system logs and calculates the response to the drugs and chemicals so much higher than it does for a drug. I mean, I'm sorry, for a hug or than it does for um, a, a slice of pizza. The brain can't differentiate, but it, 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 it charts a, a short circuit to the highest, highest, highest. Again, the goal is not to be high. The brain doesn't really know that. It's, it's all wrapped up in that survival system. If I'm hungry, I must eat to survive. If I'm thirsty, I must drink in order to survive. If I'm lonely and isolated, I must connect socially in order to thrive. The brain doesn't understand what this that this is a false um, substance, but it, it's hardwired. And this is why so many families get stuck. Well, why is your drinking and drug use more important than us, your family, the employer? If you don't stop using, you're gonna, you're gonna be fired. I can't hold on to you anymore. Why, why is the drinking and drug use so much more important than the job? The financial security, the health. It's not that it is so much more important, it is the brain has hardwired that the highest, most response of that dopamine, I didn't even mention that earlier, um, th this reward system is queued up with these, um, the dopamine release, which is the neurotransmitter, and the dopamine <coughs> reuptake, and that is all sort of a way of, of, of measures and outcomes. It measures and outcomes its way to figure out what's working and what can be better and what can sustain what can sustain a person. So when it gets kind of off chart, um, it, everything else begins to fall away. Food, shelter, clothing, relationships, the, the things that really do sustain us. And it's very, very, very difficult um, to, to help a person get to that space. Um, we have many, many people that come in um, and their idea is that this recovery thing is a linear path. As soon as I say, by gosh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get to recovery, well, guess what? Recovery is not linear. How many of you have done a diet? All right? Not to equate substance use with dieting. However, there's a similar pathway. Sometimes it's two steps forward and it's a step back and it's a hmm and it's a contemplation and a pre-contemplation and you're trying to figure out, well, maybe it'll work this way. Maybe I can have a bite of cheesecake every day. I don't know. You, it, 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 gets, it gets complicated because you've also got this great need in, inside this person who wants to connect and, and be social. I remember the first time, the first time I got sober, the first time I got sober and the holidays were coming up. And that was a, what I will call a trigger, okay? It doesn't mean I'm going to use or drink but it was an emotional trigger because, oh my gosh, I wanted to fit in, I wanted to be part of. So I had to relearn this whole process of, of coming and speaking and being in holidays and going to weddings without doing the champagne toast and being okay with that because nobody really cared if I did a champagne toast. I was telling myself that. They were fine, they didn't care, but I didn't know they didn't care. Um, so this idea of community is spot on. The idea of community because um, recovery is also very person-centered and it is very, um, it is very personal. So what works for me might not work for you or you or you. Um, and, and because of that, the community and what we need from the community um, is, is very individual. Um, some may find a pathway to recovery through church. Some may find it through medication. Some may find it through yoga uh, or a doctor. I mean, there's just so many ways. But the community part, feeling a part of, feeling connection, 
um, is, is a vital, vital part. And I'm just so thrilled. I apologize for getting emotional. I apologize for arriving at 8.59 because I went to the wrong place. But um, it looks like I've showed up right where I'm supposed to be. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kat. We're going to remain seated during the next uh, group of songs. And this is when we do the armed services. Uh, and we're going to do it in the order that the flags are in. Uh, and we do appreciate Skip Flint for bringing the flags. Stay, give a big hand for Skip to bring you to the here today. The keeper of the flags here the Veterans Day. So we start off with the Army. We then go to the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, and we end with the Coast Guard. So remain seated. And as if you have served the armed services, uh, whichever branch we're singing, if you'll please stand during that uh, particular uh, segment of singing. So if you have served in the armed services in any of the five branches, please stand as we're singing your song. You didn't know there was going to be a test also. <laughs> service to our country. We, let's give another big hand for all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Jonathan Barr, who also is with Advantage. Uh, he started in 2016, and there he started the Amends Recovery Residency called ARC, the uh, Acceptance Recovery Center. You may be familiar with it if you're around Athens. Uh, Jonathan works daily with those seeking to recover, uh, to help them find freedom from substance use, to improve their quality of life and meaningful connection with others. Uh, Jonathan considers his work not just a job, but a calling. So we want to welcome Jonathan up here. Let's give him a big hand. I'm also short. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Barr. 
Okay. And I'm a recovering heroin addict. Uh, I identify as well as a person in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is it's been over seven years since I used any mood or mind altering substance. <laughs> For me, recovery is not about just putting down the drugs. Um, recovery is, is a change, a complete overhaul of the way that you live life. It's a change of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And uh, due to the fact that I started using at a very young age, I was 11 years old, um, I had, I definitely needed an overhaul in the way that I lived life. Uh, I had not matured emotionally, uh, psychologically, or most of all spiritually uh, in that time. I had a childlike faith. Uh, you see, I, I was uh, brought up in a God-fearing home. We went to church on Sundays. My father was an evangelist. And uh, my decision to use drugs disconnected me from God. Right? And the continued choices that I made, uh, lying, cheating, stealing, uh, progressed into criminal behavior found myself further and further from God. By the age of 16, um, I was using heavy substances. I had been arrested most multiple times and put in the juvenile detention center. And I found myself homeless uh, for the first of many times. My disease progressed um, and so did my criminal behavior. Ultimately, I did three different prison sentences in the Georgia Department of Corrections. Uh, altogether, I used for 20 years. And in that time, I found myself in an endless cycle of pain, degradation, and fear. I was isolated from everyone that loved me. Because I chose to be and because they couldn't tolerate my behaviors any further. By the time I got to the end of my use, it was April 13, 2014. My last use came out of the carpet of a 99 Toyota Tacoma. It was just enough to keep me from getting sick. You see, with opioid dependence, there is a physical dependence to the drug. And this cycle of addiction took me on the next day to get the next one. I went right back to what I did every day to do what I needed to do to get more drugs. I was later arrested uh, for entering an auto with an intent to steal and possession of heroin. This was, it wasn't the first time I got arrested, but it was the first time I was happy that I was going to jail. See, I've been using against my will for a long time. I knew I was an addict couldn't stop. I was in that cycle. You know, essentially the reward center of my brain was telling me instead of eat a sandwich to survive, it was telling me do drugs to survive. I was wrapped up in that. I can't tell you guys or even begin to tell you the horrors of addiction and the stuff that I experienced in that 20 year cycle. But I'm not here to tell you about the pain. I'm here to tell you all about recovery. So on that day, I was arrested and I went to jail crying happy tears. Because I knew for some reason this time I was done. Because of that childlike faith, I went back into the cycle that I always did 
We call it jailhouse religion. I was praying foxhole prayers, asking God to get me out of my consequences so that I, I could get out and do more. That's really what I wanted. And I met an old man there. I'm not sure if he was even real. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But I know what he said to me came straight from God. He said, son, stop asking God what he can do for you and, ask, and start asking him what you can do for him. And it was at that point I found my true place of surrender. I gave up on the idea of getting out to do more. I only wanted what God wanted for me. And things began to change. I got an opportunity at treatment instead of incarceration. For the first time, they gave me an option to help my, my disease. I entered Hall County Drug Court and a Turning Point Residential, Men's Residential Program, March 2000, or May 2014. Uh, my recovery process was about finding people I could trust, connect with, utilizing the accountability and the resources that the court gave me. And slowly just beginning to do the next right thing for the next right reason. We call that practicing integrity in recovery. For me, there was a spiritual disconnect. I was still like a child. My childlike faith hadn't got me far. The Bible talks about milk instead of meat. I was still on milk at the age of 31. The drug court told me I needed to go to meetings. And they sent me to Narcotics Anonymous. I like to say NA, I, God sent me to NA and NA sent me back to God. Brought me back home. Um, like I said, it's been seven years. A lot has changed. I answered the calling to come and work with other recovering addicts, specifically to combat opioid epidemic after starting the men's residential program and realizing there was a specific need that was not get, being met uh, by standard treatment approaches and I decided to come work with crowds uh, I'm a certified addiction counselor I got a lot of letters I ain't gonna go over them there's, there's a whole lot of letters behind me I did a whole bunch of training uh, I consider myself uh, an ongoing student of, of the disease of addiction, and, and I get the opportunity to work with recovering addicts every day uh, from the point in which they're entering the crisis unit, uh, ready to detox and take that first step, all the way into long-term recovery, with years of recovery, careers, children, marriages. Uh, you know, the, the gifts of recovery are endless. Recovery is a spiritual thing. So, uh, there, it, in spirituality, to, to me, my spirituality and that my growth potential comes from my higher power, which is God, Jesus Christ. And uh, that potential, therefore, of growth is unlimited because God is unlimited. Right? So I get to see the unlimited growth potential in so many people. And my life has touched so many people in a positive way in order to do so. Personally, uh, you know... I got a wife who's in recovery. She'll have seven years in October. Uh, we have three children. Uh, my youngest is Nevea, and she's six years old. She turned six in May. And uh, I'm proud to say that she's never known her father using. That's a big deal. We got all our kids under one roof. Uh, I have a career, I have a future, I have a relationship with God. Um, you know, it's crazy. I got health insurance. 401k. <laughs> uh, me and my wife, you know, I'm a voter again. I got my voting rights back. They gave me a passport. We went, we went to Barbados for our honeymoon from a homeless drug addict to where I'm at today. Me and my wife just built our first home. 
in Jefferson this year. We got in right at the right time. God's time. Good interest rate, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I came here um, because I wanted to share a message of recovery. I wanted to put a face on the disease, but most importantly, a face for recovery. Um, you know, recovery is real. The disease of addiction is real. Uh, but we do prevail, we do overcome, and we do find meaningful purpose in life, and we turn around and we help others do the same thing. And, and that's what I wanted to share today, is that here I am, I am proof recovery is real, I'm also proof that the opi opioid epidemic is real. Uh, and we're fighting it every day, and uh, hopefully there'll be some, uh, well, this next series, I believe, there'll be some information on, on how the recovery process works, barriers, treatment, resources. Uh, I want to give you guys the solution uh, to pass on to your loved ones and the people in your community that are affected by the opioid epidemic. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. We're going to remain seated during this uh, next round of songs if you can. So as Bruce comes up to lead us, uh, we'll be medley number two.
Very very good. Great music. And y'all did an excellent job. Thank you. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Ed, would you mind getting the basket and passing it, passing it around? We've got to have all frame before the service is over, you know. No. So uh, give, give it up. All right. um, we want to say a big, big thank you to Jonathan and Kat for coming out. Give them another big hand. Thank you all for sharing. I hope you get a chance to interact with them individually before you leave and they leave. Uh, especially if you know folks that, that need, need help, please uh, be the initiator of that and help make that happen. As you heard, connection is huge, uh, community is huge, so it's important for us to take responsibilities for that. Uh, in the days ahead, so if you've not been looking at our Facebook uh, and getting our videos over the, ever since COVID started, you know, we've, we became Internet Church once uh, March 2000, uh, not 20, 2020 came in, we kind of got on the Internet. Well, we'll be having videos all during the month of July concerning the various programs and stuff that we've referenced how to get to it, where are the resources. So, so we're committed as a church to help make sure that the Lake Oconee area knows of the resources that are available. Uh, and soon a proud group uh, will be at our church or in a better geographical place, wherever they may be. But we'll make sure that you all know uh, where, where it is, where that resource is. We wanna partner uh, with Advantage and make sure we're doing all we can as a church uh, to make sure that our community can, can do all it can to help folks uh, to be in recovery. So appreciate with that. Yeah, there's money over here. Don't leave money on the table. Yeah, okay. Uh, so before you leave, if you want to be in the raffle, go back to your phone, if you would. And this time is www.samedynamicsofsurveymonkey.com front slash r front slash, but this time it's post not pre, but post Lake OCO. So please do that. You will then be entered into the raffle. And um, you know, and I, I think we'll try to get it on the website. Can we do that, get it on the website? Uh, so that if you don't have it now, get to the website, Facebook page, uh, within the next couple of days that we'll make sure that you're entered into the raffle. Please make sure you do that. We are, as people of faith, we are citizens of the United States, and we've come to celebrate today the significance of what that means, to rally around as a community, rally around as a country, to do what we need to, to continue this experiment that we call the United States of America, and continue to be better at everything that we do. And so, uh, we, we do proclaim the citizenship of our country. As people of faith, we are also citizens of a higher kingdom, and we are also part of a bigger kingdom. Uh, and in that, we, throughout the globe, wherever the church may reside, uh, really do find ourselves being instruments, or being called to be instruments of God's peace in this world. St. Francis of Assisi, 800 years ago, put it into prime, prime language that we should be out there searching for peace, bringing peace into the world uh, in all the ways we can, individually and collectively. So I invite you to stand. Uh, I'll be leading us in the prayer of St. Francis. If you know it, please join along with me. Uh, if not, just listen to the words and to apply them into your hearts and into your lives. Then we'll close this service by singing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Uh, and then we'll be finished. So thank you for coming here today. We'll be here until October, every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. So we'd love to have you on any Sunday morning uh, that you're in the area. We'd love to have you come be here. Let us bow for prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you.